Chapter 39 Circe Grandmaster Picel had been old for as long as she had known him, but he seemed to have aged another hundred years in the past three nights. It took him an eternity to bend his creaky knee before her, and once he had, he could not rise again until Sir Osmond jerked him to his feet. Circe studied him with displeasure. Lord Kyburn informs me that Lord Giles has coughed his last. Yes, your grace. I did my best to ease his passing. Did you? The queen turned to Lady Merriweather. I did say I wanted Rosby alive, did I not? You did, your grace. Sir Osmond? What is your recollection of the conversation? You commanded Grand Maester Pycelle to save the man, your grace. We all heard. Pycelle's mouth opened and closed. Your grace must know I did all that could be done for the poor man. As you did for Joffrey and his father, my own beloved husband. Robert was as strong as any man in the Seven Kingdoms, yet you lost him to a boar. Oh, and let us not forget John Aaron. No doubt you would have killed Ned Stark as well, if I had let you keep him longer. Tell me, Maester, was it at the Citadel that you learned to wring your hands and make excuses? Her voice made the old man flinch. No man could have done more, your grace. I... I have always given leal service. When you counseled King Eris to open his gates as my father's host approached, was that your notion of leal service? That? I misjudged the... Was that good counsel? Your grace must surely know. What I know is that when my son was poisoned, you proved to be of less use than Moon Boy. What I know is that the crown has desperate need of gold, and our Lord Treasurer is dead. The old fool seized upon that. I, I shall draw up a list of men suitable to take Lord Giles's place upon the council. A list? Circe was amused by his presumption. I can well imagine the sort of list you would provide me. Greybeards and grasping fools and Garth the Gross. Her lips tightened. You have been much in Lady Marjorie's company of late. Yes, yes, I... Queen Marjorie has been most distraught about Sir Loras. I provide her grace with sleeping draughts and, uh, other sorts of potions. No doubt. Tell me, was it our little queen who commanded you to kill Lord Giles? Kill? Grand Maester Pycelle's eyes grew as big as boiled eggs. Your grace cannot believe... It was his cough by all the gods. I, her grace would not. She bore Lord Giles no ill will. Why would Queen Marjorie want him dead? Why to plant another rose on Tommen's council? Are you blind or bought? Rosby stood in her way, so she put him in his grave with your connivance. Your grace, I swear to you, Lord Giles perished from his cough. His mouth was quivering. My loyalty has always been to the crown, to the realm, to, to House Lannister. In that order? Pycelle's fear was palpable. He is ripe enough. Time to squeeze the fruit and taste the juice. If you are as leal as you claim, why are you lying to me? Do not trouble to deny it. You began to dance attendance on Maid Marjorie before Sir Loris went to Dragonstone. So spare me further fables about how you want only to console our good daughter in her grief. What brings you to the Maiden Vault so often? Not Marjorie's vapid conversation, surely. Are you courting that pox-faced septa of hers? Diddling little lady Bulwer? Do you play the spy for her? 
informing on me to serve her plots. I... I obey. A maester takes an oath of service. A grand maester swears to serve the realm. Your grace, she... She is the queen. I am the queen. I meant... She is the king's wife, and... I know who she is. What I want to know is why she has need of you. Is my good daughter unwell? Unwell? The old man plucked at the thing he called a beard, that patched growth of thin white hair sprouting from the loose pink wattles under his chin. Not unwell, your grace. Not as such. My oaths forbid me to divulge. Your oaths will be of small comfort in the black cells, she warned him. I'll hear the truth or you'll wear chains. Pycel collapsed to his knees. I beg you. I was your lord father's man and a friend to you in the matter of Lord Aaron. I could not survive the dungeons. Not again. Why does Marjorie send for you? She desires. She... She... Say it! He cringed. Moon tea, he whispered. Moon tea for... I know what moon tea is for. There it is. Very well. Get off those saggy knees and try to remember what it was to be a man. Pycelle struggled to rise, but took so long about it that she had to tell Osmond Kettleback to give him another yank. As to Lord Giles, no doubt our father above will judge him justly. He left no children? No children of his body, but there is a ward. Not of his blood. Circe dismissed that annoyance with a flick of her hand. Giles knew of our dire need for gold. No doubt he told you of his wish to leave all his lands and wealth to Tommen. Rosby's gold would help refresh their coffers, and Rosby's lands and castle could be bestowed upon one of her own as a reward for leal service. Lord Waters, perhaps. Orain had been hinting at his need for a seat. His lordship was only an empty honor without one. He had his eye on Dragonstone, Cersei knew, but there he aimed too high. Rosby would be more suitable to his birth and station. Lord Giles loved his grace with all his heart, Pycelle was saying. But his ward will doubtless understand. Once he hears you speak of Lord Giles' dying wish, go and see it done. If it please your grace. Grand Maester Pycelle almost tripped over his own robes in his haste to leave. Lady Merriweather closed the door behind him. Moonty, she said as she turned back to the queen. How foolish of her. Why would she do such a thing? Take such a risk. The little queen has appetites that Tom and is as yet too young to satisfy. That was always a danger when a grown woman was married to a child. Even more so with a widow. She may claim that Renly never touched her, but I will not believe it. Women only drank moon tea for one reason. Maidens had no need for it at all. My son has been betrayed. Marjorie has a lover. That is high treason, punishable by death. She could only hope that Mace Tyrell's prune-faced harridan of a mother lived long enough to see the trial. By insisting that Tom and Marjorie be wed at once, Lady Olena had condemned her precious rose to a headsman's sword. Jamie made off with Sir Ilan Payne. I suppose I shall need to find a new king's justice to snick her head off. I'll do it, offered Osmond Kettleback with an easy grin. Marjorie's got a pretty little neck. A good sharp sword will go right through it. It would, said Tana. But there is a Tyrell army at Storm's End, and another at Maidenpool. They have sharp swords as well. I am awash in roses. It was vexing. She still had need of Mace Tyrell, if not his daughter. 
at least until such time as Stannis is defeated. Then I shan't need any of them. But how could she rid herself of the daughter without losing the father? Treason is treason, she said. But we must have proof, something more substantial than moon tea. If she's proved to be untrue, even her own lord father must condemn her, or her shame becomes his own. Kettleback chewed on one end of his mustache. We need to catch them during the deed. How? Kyburn has eyes on her day and night. Her serving men take my coin, but bring us only trifles. Yet no one has seen this lover. The ears outside her door hear singing, laughter, gossip. Nothing of any use. Marjorie is too shrewd to be caught so easily, said Lady Merryweather. Her women are her castle walls. They sleep with her, dress her, pray with her, read with her, sew with her. When she's not hawking or riding, she's playing come into my castle with little Alison Bulwer. Whenever men are about, her scepter will be with her, or her cousins. She must rid herself of her hens some time the queen insisted. A thought struck her. Unless her ladies are part of it as well. Not all of them, perhaps, but some. The cousins? Even Tana sounded doubtful. All three are younger than the little queen, and more innocent. Wantons clad in maidens white. That only makes their sins more shocking. Their names will live in shame." Suddenly the queen could almost taste it. Tana, your lord husband is my justiciar. The two of you must sup with me this very night. She wanted this done quickly, before Marjorie took it in her little head to return to Highgarden, or sail to Dragonstone to be with her wounded brother at death's door. I shall command the cooks to roast a boar for us, and of course we must have some music to help with our digestion. Tana was very quick. Music. Just so. Go and tell your lord husband and make arrangements for the singer, Circe urged. Sir Osmond, you may remain. We have much and more to discuss. I shall have need of Kyburn, too. Sad to say, the kitchens proved to have no wild boar on hand, and there was not time enough to send out hunters. Instead, the cooks butchered one of the castle sows and served them ham studded with cloves and basted with honey and dried cherries. It was not what Circe wanted, but she made do. Afterward, they had baked apples with a sharp white cheese. Lady Tana savored every bite. Not so Orton Merriweather, whose round face remained blotched and pale from broth to cheese. He drank heavily and kept stealing glances at the singer. "'A great pity about Lord Giles,' Circe said at last. "'I dare say none of us will miss his coughing, though.' No, uh, no, I'd think not. We shall have need of a new Lord Treasurer. If the Vale were not so unsettled, I would bring back Peter Baelish, but I am minded to try Sir Harris in the office. He can do no worse than Giles, and at least he does not cough. Sir Harris is the King's hand, said Tana. Sir Harris is a hostage, and feeble even at that. It is time that Tommen had a more forceful hand. Lord Orton lifted his gaze from his wine cup. Forceful, uh, to be sure. He hesitated. Who? You, my lord. It is in your blood. Your grandsire took my own father's place as hand to heiress. Replacing Tywin Lannister with Owen Merriweather had proved to be akin to replacing a destrier with a donkey, to be sure. But Owen had been an old, done man when Eris raised him, amiable if ineffectual. His grandson was younger, and... Well, he has a strong wife. It was a pity Tana could not serve his hand. She was thrice the man her husband was, and far more amusing. She was also mirish born and female, however, so Orton must need suffice. I have no doubt that you are more able than Sir Harris. The contents of my chamber pot are more able than Sir Harris. Will you consent to serve? I, uh, yes, of course. Your grace does me great honor. A greater one than you deserve. You have served me ably as Justiciar, my lord, 
and will continue to do so through these trying times ahead. When she saw that Merriweather had grasped her meaning, the queen turned to smile at the singer. And you must be rewarded as well for all the sweet songs you have played for us whilst we ate. The gods have given you a gift. The singer bowed. Your grace is kind to say so. Not kind, said Circe. Merely truthful. Tana tells me that you are called the Blue Bard. I am, your grace. The singer's boots were supple blue calfskin, his breeches fine blue wool. The tunic he wore was pale blue silk slashed with shiny blue satin. He had even gone so far as to dye his hair blue, in the Tyroshi fashion. Long and curly, it fell to his shoulders and smelled as if it had been washed in rose water. From blue roses, no doubt. At least his teeth are white. They were good teeth, not the least bit crooked. You have no other name? A hint of pink suffused his cheeks. As a boy, I was called Watt. A fine name for a plowboy. Less fitting for a singer. The blue bard's eyes were the same color as Robert's. For that alone, she hated him. It is easy to see why you are Lady Marjorie's favorite. Her grace is kind. She says I give her pleasure. Oh, I'm certain of it. Might I see your loot? If it please your grace. Beneath the courtesy, there was a hint of unease. But he handed her the loot all the same. One does not refuse the queen's request. Circe plucked a string and smiled at the sound. Sweet and sad as love. Tell me, what? The first time you took Marjorie to bed, was that before she wed my son, or after? For a moment he did not seem to understand. When he did, his eyes grew large. Your grace has been misinformed. I swear to you, I never— Liar! Circe smashed the loot across the singer's face so hard that painted wood exploded into shards and splinters. Lord Orton, summon my guards and take this creature to the dungeons. Orton Merriweather's face was damp with fear. This, oh, infamy, he dared seduce the queen? I fear it was the other way around, but he is a traitor all the same. Let him sing for Lord Kyburn. The blue bard went white. No. Blood dripped from his lip where the loot had torn it. I never... When Merriweather seized him by the arm, he screamed, Mother of mercy, no! I am not your mother, Circe told him. Even in the black cells, all they got from him were denials, prayers, and pleas for mercy. Before long, blood was streaming down his chin from all his broken teeth, and he had wet his dark blue breeches three times over... Yet still the man persisted in his lies. Is it possible we have the wrong singer? Circe asked. All things are possible, your grace. Have no fear. The man will confess before the night is done. Down here in the dungeons, Kyburn wore rough spun wool and a blacksmith's leather apron. To the blue bard, he said, I am sorry if the guards were rough with you. Their courtesies are sadly lacking. His voice was kind, solicitous. All we want from you is the truth. I've told you the truth, the singer sobbed. Iron shackles held him hard against the cold stone wall. We know better. Kyburn had a razor in his hand, its edge gleaming faintly in the torchlight. He cut away the blue bard's clothing until the man was naked but for his high blue boots. The hair between his legs was brown. Circe was amused to see. "'Tell us how you pleasured the little queen,' she commanded. "'I never... I sang was all. I sang and played. Her ladies will tell you. They were always with us, her cousins.' "'How many of them did you have carnal knowledge of?' "'None of them. I'm just a singer, please!' Kyburn said. "'Your grace.' Mayhaps this poor man only played for Marjorie while she entertained other lovers. No, please, she never... I sang, I only sang! Lord Kyburn ran a hand up the blue bard's chest. Does she take your nipples in her mouth during your love play? He took one between his thumb and forefinger, 
and twisted. Some men enjoy that. Their nipples are as sensitive as a woman's. The razor flashed. The singer shrieked. On his chest, a wet red eye wept blood. Circe felt ill. Part of her wanted to close her eyes, to turn away, to make it stop. But she was the queen, and this was treason. Lord Tywin would not have turned away. In the end, the blue bard told them his whole life, back to his first name day. His father had been a chandler, and Watt was raised to that trade. But as a boy, he found he had more skill at making lutes than barrels. When he was twelve, he ran off to join a troupe of musicians he had heard performing at a fair. He had wandered half the reach before coming to King's Landing in hopes of finding favor at court. Favor? Kyburn chuckled. Is that what women call it now? I fear you found too much of it, my friend, and from the wrong queen. The true one stands before you. Yes. Circe blamed Marjorie Tyrell for this. If not for her, Watt might have lived a long and fruitful life singing his little songs and betting pig girls and crofters' daughters. Her scheming forced this on me. She has soiled me with her treachery. By dawn, the singer's high blue boots were full of blood, and he had told them how Marjorie would fondle herself as she watched her cousins pleasuring him with their mouths. At other times, he would sing for her while she sated her lusts with other lovers. "'Who were they?' the queen demanded." and the wretched Watt named Sir Talad the Tall, Lambert Turnberry, Jalabar Zoe, the Red Wine Twins, Osney Kettleback, Hugh Clifton, and the Knight of Flowers. That displeased her. She dare not besmirch the name of the hero of Dragonstone. Besides, no one who knew Sir Loras would ever believe it. The Red Wines could not be a part of it either. Without the arbor and its fleet, the realm could never hope to rid itself of this Euron's crow's eye and his accursed iron men. All you are doing is spitting up the names of men you saw about her chambers. We want the truth! The truth? Watt looked at her with the one blue eye that Kyburn had left him. Blood bubbled through the holes where his front teeth had been. I might have misremembered. Horace and Hopper had no part of this, did they? No, he admitted. Not them. As for Sir Loris, I am certain Marjorie took pains to hide what she was doing from her brother. She did. I remember now. Once I had to hide under the bed when Sir Loris came to see her. He must never know, she said. I prefer this song to the other. Leave the great lords out of it. That was for the best. The others, though. Sir Talad had been a hedge knight. Jalabar Zoe was an exile and a beggar. Clifton was only one of the queen's guardsmen. And Osney is the plum that makes the pudding. I know you feel better for having told the truth. You will want to remember that when Marjorie comes to trial. If you were to start lying again... I won't. I'll tell it true. And after... You will be allowed to take the black. You have my word on that. Circe turned to Kyburn. See that his wounds are cleaned and dressed, and give him milk of the poppy for the pain. Your grace is good. Kyburn dropped the bloody razor into a pail of vinegar. Marjorie may wonder where her bard has gone. Singers come and go. They are infamous for it. The climb up the dark stone steps from the black cells left Circe feeling breathless. I must rest. Getting to the truth was wearisome work, and she dreaded what must follow. I must be strong. What I must do, I do for Tommen and the realm. It was a pity that Maggie the Frog was dead. Piss on your prophecy, old woman. The little queen may be younger than I, but she was never more beautiful." and soon she will be dead. Lady Merriweather was waiting in her bedchamber. It was the black of night, closer to dawn than to dusk. Jocelyn and Dorcas were both asleep, but not Tana. Was it terrible? she asked. You cannot know. I need to sleep, but fear to dream. Tana stroked her hair. It was all for Tommen. 
It was. I know it was. Cersei shuddered. My throat is raw. Be a sweet and pour me some wine. If it please you, that is all that I desire. Liar. She knew what Taina desired. So be it. If the woman was besotted with her, that would help ensure that she and her husband remained loyal. In a world so full of treachery, that was worth a few kisses. She's no worse than most men. At least there's no danger of her ever getting me with child. The wine helped, but not enough. I feel soiled, the queen complained as she stood beside her window, cup in hand. A bath will set you right, my sweet. Lady Merriweather woke Dorcas and Jocelyn and set them for hot water. As the tub was filled, she helped the queen disrobe, undoing her laces with deft fingers and easing her gown off her shoulders. Then she slipped out of her own dress and let it puddle on the floor. The two of them shared the bath together, with Cersei lying back in Tana's arms. Tommen must be spared the worst of this, she told the Mirish woman. Marjorie still takes him to the Sept every day so they can ask the gods to heal her brother. Sir Loras still clung to life, annoyingly. He's fond of her cousins as well. It will go hard on him to lose them all. All three may not be guilty, suggested Lady Merriweather. Why, it might well be that one of them took no part. If she was shamed and sickened by the things she saw, she might be persuaded to bear witness against the others. Yes, very good. But which one is the innocent? Allah. The shy one? So she seems. But there is more of sly than shy in her. Leave her to me, my sweet. Gladly. Alone, the blue bard's confession would never suffice. Singers lied for their living, after all. Allah Tyrell would be of great help if Taina could deliver her. Sir Osney shall confess as well. The others must be made to understand that only through confession can they earn the king's forgiveness and the wall. Jalabar Zo would find the truth attractive. About the rest, she was less certain. But Kyburn was persuasive. Dawn was breaking over King's Landing when they climbed from the tub. The queen's skin was white and wrinkled from her long immersion. Stay with me, she told Taina. I do not want to sleep alone. She even said a prayer before she crawled beneath her coverlet, beseeching the mother for sweet dreams. It proved a waste of breath. As ever, the gods were deaf. Cersei dreamt that she was down in the black cells once again. Only this time it was her chained to the wall in place of the singer. She was naked, and blood dripped from the tips of her breasts where the imp had torn off her nipples with his teeth. Please, she begged. Please not my children. Don't harm my children. Tyrion only leered at her. He was naked too, covered with coarse hair that made him look more like a monkey than a man. You shall see them crowned, he said, and you shall see them die. Then he took her bleeding breast into his mouth and began to suck, and pain sawed through her like a hot knife. She woke shuddering in Tana's arms. A bad dream, she said weakly. Did I scream? I'm sorry. Dreams turn to dust in light of day. Was it the dwarf again? Why does he frighten you so, this silly little man? He is going to kill me. It was foreseen when I was ten. I wanted to know who I would marry, but she said, She? The May guy. The words came tumbling out of her. She could still hear Malara Heatherspoon insisting that if they never spoke about the prophecies, they would not come true. She was not so silent in the well, though. She screamed and shouted. Tyrion is the Volonkar, she said. Do you use that word in Mir? It's High Valyrian. It means little brother. She had asked Septa Serenella about the word after Malara drowned. Tana took her hand and stroked it. This was a hateful woman, old and sick and ugly. You were young and beautiful. "'full of life and pride. 
She lived in Lannisport, you said, so she would have known of the dwarf and how he killed your lady mother. This creature dared not strike you because of who you were, so she sought to wound you with her viper's tongue. Could it be? Cersei wanted to believe it. Malara died, though, just as she foretold. I never wed Prince Rhaegar and Joffrey. The dwarf killed my son before my eyes. One son, said Lady Meriwether. But you have another, sweet and strong, and no harm will ever come to him. Never, whilst I live. Saying it helped her believe that it was so. Dreams turn to dust in light of day. Yes. Outside, the morning sun was shining through a haze of cloud. Cersei slipped out from under the blankets. I will break my fast with the king this morning. I want to see my son. All I do, I do for him. Tommen helped restore her to herself. He had never been more precious to her than he was that morning, chattering about his kittens as he dribbled honey onto a chunk of hot black bread fresh from the ovens. Sir Pounce caught a mouse, he told her, but Lady Whiskers stole it from him. I was never so sweet and innocent, Cersei thought. How can he ever hope to rule in this cruel realm? The mother in her wanted only to protect him. The queen in her knew he must grow harder, or the Iron Throne was certain to devour him. Sir Pounce must learn to defend his rights, she told him. In this world, the weak are always the victims of the strong. The king considered that, licking honey off his fingers. When Sir Loras comes back, I'm going to learn to fight with Lance and Sword and Morningstar, the same way he does. You will learn to fight, the queen promised, but not from Sir Loras. He will not be coming back, Tommen. Marjorie says he will. We pray for him. We ask for the mother's mercy and for the warrior to give him strength. Eleanor says that this is Sir Loras' hardest battle. She smoothed his hair back the soft golden curls that reminded her so much of Joff. "'Will you be spending this afternoon with your wife and her cousins?' "'Not today. She has to fast and purify herself,' she said. "'Fast and purify? Oh, for Maiden's Day.' It had been years since Circe had been required to observe that particular holy day. Thrice wed, yet she would still have us believe she is a maid. Demure and white, the little queen would lead her hens to Baylor's sep to light tall white candles at the maiden's feet and hang parchment garlands about her holy neck. A few of her hens, at least. On Maiden's Day, widows, mothers, and whores alike were barred from the septs, along with men, lest they profane the sacred songs of innocence. Only virgin maids could... Mother, did I say something wrong? Cersei kissed her son's brow. You said something very wise, sweetling. Now run along and play with your kittens. Afterward, she summoned Sir Osney Kettle back to her solar. He came in sweaty from the yard and swaggering, and as he took a knee, he undressed her with his eyes, the way he always did. Rise, sir, and sit here next to me. You did me a valiant service once, but now I have a harder task for you. Aye. And I have something hard for you. That must wait. She traced his scars lightly with the tips of his, her fingers. Do you recall the whore who gave these to you? I'll give her to you when you come back from the wall. Would you like that? It's you I want. That was the right answer. First, you must confess your treason. A man's sins can poison his soul if left to fester. I know it must be hard for you to live with what you've done. It is past time that you rid yourself of your shame. Shame? Osney sounded baffled. I told Osmond, Marjorie just teases. She never lets me do any more than... It is chivalrous of you to protect her, Cersei broke in. But you are too good a knight to go on living with your crime. No, you must take yourself to the Great Sept of Baylor this very night and speak with the High Septon. When a man's sins are so black, only his High Holiness himself can save him from hell's torments. 
Tell him how you bedded Marjorie and her cousins. Osney blinked. What, the cousins too? Mega and Eleanor, she decided. Never Allah. That little detail would make the whole story more plausible. Allah would sit weeping and plead with the others to stop their sinning. Just Mega and Eleanor, or Marjorie too? Marjorie, most certainly. She was the one behind it all. She told him all she had in mind. As Osney listened, apprehension slowly spread across his face. When she finished, he said, After you cut her head off, I mean to take that kiss she never gave me. You may take all the kisses you like. And then the wall? For just a little while. Tommen is a forgiving king. Osney scratched at his scarred cheek. Usually if I lie about some woman, it's me saying how I never fucked them and them saying how I did. This. I never lied to no high septon before. I think you go to some hell for that. One of the bad ones. The queen was taken aback. The last thing she expected was piety from a kettleback. Are you refusing to obey me? No. Osney touched her golden hair. The thing is, the best lies have some truth in them. To give them flavor, as it were. And you want me to go tell how I fucked a queen? She almost slapped his face. Almost. But she had gone too far, and too much was at stake. All I do, I do for Tommen. She turned her head and caught Sir Osney's hand with her own kissing his fingers. They were rough and hard, calloused from the sword. Robert had hands like that, she thought. Cersei wrapped her arms about his neck. I would not want it said I made a liar of you, she whispered in a husky voice. Give me an hour and meet me in my bedchamber. We waited long enough. He thrust his fingers inside the bodice of her gown and yanked and the silk parted with a ripping sound so loud that Cersei was afraid that half of the Red Keep must have heard it. "'Take off the rest before I tear that, too,' he said. "'You can keep the crown on. I like you in your crown.'